All right, tonight turn to Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to try to start a new study tonight, and we'll just call it a survey of the Bible. And we'll look at portions. We're going to look at Genesis 1 through 11 tonight. Next week, if you want to read ahead, you can look at Genesis 12 through and uh, just freshen up on, on that scripture. When I try to share Christ with somebody in today's world, particularly a, a traditional college student or that age, I start with, do you believe God? Do you believe God created the heaven and the earth? And if they say no, it's pretty much an impasse. If they will refuse to believe that there's a God, it's kind of hard to get beyond that. But most of them think at least there's a higher power or somebody out there that created the earth. And I'll say, okay, well, we'll go with that. And um, just for the sake of argument, we'll call the creation, the world, and all that's in it, God created. And then we'll go from there. And that's where we begin. And as we, we look to Genesis chapter 1, we deal with where we come from and what's our problem. And that's a big issue that needs to be settled in today's world. You need to know where you come from. You didn't just evolve. I think about sometimes I'm so glad I didn't evolve into something like a slug. Um, There's so many better things, but, you know, evolution just doesn't hold water. It just, that argument just doesn't hold up. And so that doesn't work. To think that somebody else uh, or I was in some other body uh, a thousand years ago or a hundred years ago, and now I'm in this body, and then I'll be in another body... Well, that just doesn't seem to make good sense, uh, logically. And so there's no, no argument, philosophical argument or religious argument apart from God created all things that really makes sense. We don't understand God created all things. There's no way to test it. Nobody was there to see it. But by faith, we look around us, and as, as uh, Paul wrote to the Roman church, you look around and you can't see anything but the handiwork of God. And so God created all things. So uh, we assume that. That's chapter uh, 1, verse 1 and 2. God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was void and without form, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the earth, and, and He brought um, form, brought structure to the earth. And we still enjoy that. And so we look at the creation and the fall of man. God created Adam from the dust of the earth. He created man in his own image. Uh, which is the spirit. Then Eve was created. God took the rib of Eve and made a man. The rib is, I uh, understand, I, I didn't go to med school. I didn't learn it when I was in seminary, anything about med school. But um, I understand if you remove a rib, it will grow back. Have you all heard that? No? Well, I read that somewhere. And if you read it, it's true, right? <laughs> anyway... God took. <laughs> I don't think that was it, but anyway, uh, I forgot where I read it. Maybe National Enquirer. I don't know, but um, God took one of Adam's ribs, and from that rib He created Eve. And if you think about it, that would mean that she had a very similar genetic uh, similarity. But the genetics were so pure when God first made Adam and first made Eve that there wasn't problems with genetic things that we know of today. But Adam's wife, we know, had some issues she had to deal with. She didn't fully trust God. She partially trusted God. With, with Adam, he was there. Uh, when God created everything and created Adam, he was there. He saw it all, and he talked and walked with God. With Eve, she heard from Adam what he, she was supposed to do, and um, she didn't fully trust God 100%. Her lack of faith led to her sin, and many still wrestle with the question, does God really have my best in mind? And that's what Satan got her with. Is, is God withholding something from you? You ever feel like God is holding back on you, that everybody else is being blessed and you're not? And why aren't you being blessed if everybody else is being blessed? You ever wonder that? I think most of us do at some point or another. It's a temptation Satan uses. And sometimes we feel like, God, I've struggled in this for a long time. And I just don't see how we're going to make it any difference. And God, I, I trust in you, and I'm, I'm trusting you to make a difference, and it still seems to be the same. So Satan tempts us that way. Same way he did Eve. 
Things hadn't changed that much. But God gave clear instructions about what they could eat and what they couldn't eat. And if you think about it, we have a host of commands of God that we need to kind of observe and keep. Adam and Eve had one command, just one. And it wasn't a matter of trying to figure out all the, the, uh, the complex rules and how to apply them and how they, they work. One, one command, don't eat the fruit on a particular tree. And we don't know what the fruit was, but we know it was very attractive because Satan tempted Eve because it looked so good, it looked good to eat, and it probably smelled good. But one commandment, one commandment, and they didn't keep it. They sinned. Satan planted a seed of doubt in Eve's mind. Why would a loving God want Eve to miss out on having more knowledge? If God really loved you, well, then he'd allow this or that, right? Well, that's temptation from Satan. Wouldn't Satan, or, or wouldn't God want you to be happy, have more pleasure in life? And, you know, that same argument is still going around. Satan's still tempting why would God keep Eve from enjoying some fruit? It's just a piece of fruit. What's the big deal? And there wasn't any big deal. What the big deal was is God said, don't do it. That's all it is. God said, don't do it. And she didn't obey. And that's a big deal. Eve decided to eat the fruit. And God, God had created a situation where Adam and Eve could choose and we're in that situation, too. You can choose to do God's Word, or you can choose to live a secular life. And sometimes there are consequences with our choice, and we'll see that they didn't accept the consequences too good either. So will you live by what pleases God, or will you choose something else that really displeases God? Well, the result of the fall, there were consequences. And after the disobedience of Adam and Eve, they were filled with shame and guilt. And they felt like they needed to hide. They needed to cover up their bodies. They needed to hide behind something. So when God came looking for them, he knew where they were. But he called out and said, Adam, where are you? Where are you, Adam? As if he needed to be told. But they were suddenly feeling like they were exposed. In chapter 3, verse 9, they tried to hide from God. And God said... Where are you? Tried to call him out. But what he was really asking was, where are your hearts? And sometimes we come to church and that's what God is saying. Where is your heart? Are you really focused on worship when you come in? Are you really focused? We went to church in um, Cheyenne and, and uh, I had some questions. And during the service, during the song service, during the song, I got the answer. And so after the service, I told the music director, I said, during, I came in with a question during the song service, I got my answer. And I said, usually the people say, well, you'll hear it from the preacher. And I just wanted to let you know that music is important too. <laughs> and uh, he never knew what I was asking about, but he appreciated knowing that the music made a difference. But do you think you can blatantly disregard God and hide from God and be okay. That's what God asked Adam and Eve. You think you can just blatantly sin? You can just blatantly do what I said don't do. You can eat of the fruit which I said don't eat of. And then you can hide from me as if it didn't happen. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit speaks to us about. In verse 10, I, God asked Adam to give an account of their behavior. And Adam said, well, God, it's really your fault. You gave me the woman. So it's not really my fault. You put her down here, and you gave her to me, and she offered me this fruit. It's, it's her fault and your fault for putting her here, not my fault. And that's how our world is today. It's just blame anything but take responsibility. It's no, no take not responsibility. And that's where we're going wrong. We need to come to God, and the Scripture says, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. To repent, we have to admit that we're wrong. If we don't admit we're wrong, we're just like Adam and Eve were when they were blaming. We always have a choice to sin or to obey. Eve blamed the serpent, and the serpent had some things to say. So God spoke to the serpent words of judgment. Verse 15, chapter 3, verse 15, Satan will bruise the heel of God's people, but he'll, and he'll have a negative effect on their lives, but the wound won't be lethal. 
but his head will be crushed. And so we will be wounded. We will be we will suffer because of Satan, but not destroyed. And verse 16 through 19, the sin of Adam and Eve still has an effect on all people. They they introduced a pattern of sin that we see in their children when Cain killed Abel because he was angry with God. God said, bring a blood sacrifice. And Cain grew a garden. He wanted to bring some of the produce he had grown, which is really God given the produce growth. He wanted to bring some of the produce to God and offer it as a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, and God didn't accept it. But he accepted Abel's blood sacrifice. So Cain was, was really upset with God. He took it out on Abel and killed it. In chapter 6, verse 5 through 8, sin continued to spread. And so God had, had to destroy all that he created. He was cleansing the earth of all sin. You may ask, was that overkill? Couldn't God have done something else? Sin is, is really bad to God. Some sin is worse than other sin to God. But sin is really bad. And it was so bad, it had gotten so bad that he said, I'm going to destroy the whole world. And, you know, we, we tend to, in our society, want to make sin okay. So we have categories. This is really bad sin. You know, murder is really bad. Some other things are really bad. And then some things are like what we call a white lie. What's the difference between a white lie and a black lie? They're both a lie to God. And, and so we try to make it okay. But our logic doesn't stand up to God. God looks at the heart, and he looks at the source of the action of our sin. And usually it comes from a spirit of rebellion uh, against the word of God, and that's what God sees. But all sin is an abomination. What God does is ultimately loving. It's ultimately grace, whether we understand it or not. And so we can be real judgmental about God and say, God is too harsh. He's a harsh God. He's a judgmental God. And uh, there was a man who lived across the street from me in my last church. And we'd come over and he'd talk for hours on end. And we were doing apologetics, essentially. And he said, the, the Bible says to fear God. And I'm, I don't want to worship a God I have to be afraid of. Well, I think it would be good if we were afraid of God. He's bigger than us. And there's no need to be afraid if we're living right. If we're obeying God and we're going along right with God and we're doing the commands and all, no need to be afraid. But if we're living in our own life, apart from God, there may be a reason to be afraid. And so, maybe so. Well, then we come to the flood. Uh, God decided he was going to cleanse the earth. So God told Noah he was going to send a great flood. And Noah was to build an ark. Now here, Noah had a choice. Noah didn't have to build the ark. He would have drowned with everybody else if he hadn't. But by faith, he did build the ark. It took him over 100 years. And sometimes we think, well, how long am I going to have to put up with this, Lord? And for 100 years, apparently Noah was being ridiculed, made fun of. He was preaching all that time, uh, preaching repentance, get right with God, come help build the ark, <laughs> get on the ark. For 100 years. And never had a convert, except his own family. He gathered seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, one pair of unclean, seven pairs of every kind of bird. And I read somewhere that the way that probably happened, or could have happened, is that there was drought, and all the animals came to a water source, and there was water right there where he was building the ark. And so that could be one way that God brought the animals to him. God could have just put it in the animal to go get on the ark, too. So we don't know. But God gave detailed information on the exact dimensions of the ark and the building materials and how it was to be done. And Noah followed, apparently to a T, everything God said and built the ark. So in chapter 7, verse 24, the rain came down for 40 days. The flood was not a 40-day flood. It rained for 40 days. And not only did it rain, but water came up from the deep and came down from above. And so the whole landscape changed. Forty is a number for judgment. God was judging the earth and bringing the rain, the flood, and wiped out all the, everybody that wasn't on the ark. In chapter 8, verse 14, the rain stopped, and about a year later, they got off the ark, and 
begin to repopulate the world. In chapter 8, verse 20, the first thing they did was Noah offered a sacrifice to God. It was a worship service. So all that time, and when he got off, he worshiped. God doesn't owe us anything. Uh, sometimes I think people come to a point that think God owes me, especially in the church where we've done a lot of service. We're, old, we're the old folk. We've been doing this a long time. We did the children work. We did youth work. We did young family work. We did everything there was to do. And we've been tithing faithfully. We've been serving faithfully. And we may get to think God owes us. We never reach the point that God owes us. You can add up everything that everybody in this room has done all through the years, collectively, doesn't match up to what Jesus did for us on the cross. And only he could do that. So God doesn't owe us. And we keep giving because we worship God and serve God. Okay, the greatest freedom and joy you'll know is found in God's work, and it's offered to us as a gift. So if God calls you to a special service, a special area of ministry, and sometimes the ministry is a ministry of suffering. I knew a lady one time said that when she first married, she had her in-laws that were sickly. She had to take care of her mother-in-law until she died. She took care of her father-in-law until he died. And then her husband was sick. She took care of him until he died. And now she's on Social Security, and her knees are getting bad. And she said, I've taken care of sick people all my life. It wasn't very pleasant. That's not a very... Um, coveted calling, I don't think. But that was her ministry. Sometimes our calling is more difficult than we would like, but that's where we find the most joy and the most satisfaction and the most happiness. The greatest peace is being right where God calls us to be and keep serving Him. God loves you. And we can't do anything to earn God's love, but we get God's love, and when we obey God, we understand it even better. But since God loves us, we don't understand how he could allow the flood to kill everybody. It just doesn't seem to go, does it? Well, the better question is, why did God allow the eight to live, those on the ark? They were sinful, too. The difference was God found grace. Uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He had faith. If he didn't have faith, he wouldn't have built the ark. If he didn't have faith, he wouldn't have gotten on. If he didn't, if the children didn't have faith, they wouldn't have gotten on the ark. And so he had faith. I'm sure he invited all the population around that area, but they didn't have faith enough to get on the ark. They just thought he was crazy. So they get off the ark and they begin to settle and spread out. And it brings us to the story of Babel. But at about this time, or sometime in this time, it could be. 100-year difference, 1,000-year difference. We don't really know. It's the story of Job. Um, the earth was being filled with people. They were migrating. They were really filling the earth fast. God gave Satan permission to bring trouble to Job. He lost all his businesses, his flocks, his herds. He lost his children. He lost his health. And he still looked to God and praised God. Sometimes we're in a tough spot. And if God's a loving God, why, why would he allow that? We don't know all things. We know God is good, even in troubled times. Even when we don't understand what's going on in our life. God is good. He loves us. He has grace. But eventually the people gathered and wanted to outsmart God in this era, the, the ones around the time of Babel. And so they wanted to build a tower. They wanted to build a building that would be higher than the floodwaters had been. And so they could escape the flood if it comes again. They wanted to make a name for themselves. They weren't interested in making a name for God. And God did something so simple. All he did was change their language. Can you imagine speaking English today? Maybe tomorrow wake up and speak French or something. That would be confusing, wouldn't it? Well, they couldn't work together because they couldn't understand each other. And so they spread out, dispersed like God wanted them to in the beginning. Well, the Bible, Bible is a story about a Savior. It was written by 40 authors over 1,600 years. Some of them didn't know each other and never met. 
Some of them never read the other parts of the what had been written. But it's a story with complete continuity through about a Savior, Jesus Christ. And our part is pretty simple. We just simply obey. We don't understand always. That's what where we call in faith. We choose to believe God's word is true. We choose to do God's word because we believe it is God's word. And then we know the blessings. Uh, next week we'll look at uh, Genesis 12 through 50, the uh, call of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and through the end of, of um, Genesis. And we're going to try to do this for a little while. I hope you enjoy it. And um, I'll try to bring in more details as, as I know them. Let's pray.